you so much for coming and showing up for this death row presentation. That's like after the last coffee break. So I, I'm, I'm really proud of you that you didn't take the decision to just leave. So I'm Daniel. Uh, I'm coming from Berlin from a company called Shopify slash Oberlo. And uh, I have to give you like a short background on where I'm coming from because I might share some controversial uh, viewpoints here today. So I'm doing like data for 10 years and startups like 20-ish. And uh, I'm certified up to having like you know, 20, 30, 50 million of users. And uh, I've been called all kinds of names, really. Uh, this is, I think, one of the trouble in our industry to come up with these very innovative titles, I might say. But besides working in a very diverse set of industries like e-commerce, uh, productivity, uh, I've seen AWS, I've seen Azure, I've seen the GCP, so I might say that I might be a bit like having a perspective that's not like final, but I think uh, I try to give you like a realistic view of the state of the union here. And again, as far as I'm doing this for quite some time, I don't really get excited if like a new JavaScript framework comes out. And the only thing I kind of adopted from reading Gartner reports for too long is the concept of total cost of ownership. If you think I miss something, or I, uh, say something bad, just come to me. I'm super happy to get your feedback on this because this whole thing started out like two years ago when I did like a keynote at the Data Ladies in Berlin and uh, with a sole uh, purpose of sharing this kind of anonymous alcoholics, anonymous data people crying group to share also like what's bad or what's not really working the way we expect in this community. But still my main message stayed like this. Uh, just keep it simple, stupid, and if you walk away with these four Polo Coelho messages, you're already done good for humanity. Um, but I might have to add some more because I've been working for some companies in the last two years. I talked to a lot of you. I'm super happy for all these feedbacks you gave me to, throughout these years. So besides not over engineering things and trying to do what actually needed to be done, I think I also figured that if we figure what to worry about and what not to worry about, we're in a good place. And uh, if we can have this kind of self-reflection to understand that we are not Google and it's Google and it's good that way, then we're already in a good place. So I'm still old, slow, lazy, and stupid. Your mileage may vary here, but uh, let's get to the bold things. Now I really think that the hype curve is over and it's more like a war for your attention, for your resources, be them money, time, investment, or choosing tools. And more and more companies really working to get your data logged in into their systems, which is not a good place to be. And I believe, based again, on like conversations, these are things you typically worry about these days. Machine learning and deep learning. Some people still worry about GDPR when you have to compile to something in 30 days. But I believe we are kind of misled in this one. So I think that we should worry about completely different set of problems. Ad blockers, ELT, not ETL, but ELT, and also like CRM, which is like a super unsexy but not solved problem yet. Not extract, transform, and load, but extract, load, and transform. So like the whole concept of staging and it's kind of mixed up a bit. I'm trying to uh, stand on the shoulders of giants, and this is coming from Monica Rogatti. You might have seen this Maslow pyramid of, of uh, data science and what you need to do like different, more and more complicated things in production for your company. And uh, the previous version of the presentation like two years ago was more like coming how different roles in a company evolve and how they work together. Right now I'm trying to use this hierarchy to reflect on how the roles actually appear. What is the order of the roles they appear in a company? And I'm typically trying to talk about like startup or startupish uh, companies or companies that pretend to be startup. So as you could imagine, typically you try to build this pyramid in the middle. Okay? This is what happens. First you have some kind of business analyst type of role appearing in a company. So you start aggregating and labeling your data without any foundation. And uh, the main message here still 
stay the same that if you're doing any kind of business analytics, business intelligence, call it whatever you want, you cannot skip leg day. You really have to understand what you're talking about. What are the definitions, the business definitions, the processes? What are the beans that you are counting, okay? And for that, it's very wise to actually make programmatic KPI definitions. I don't care if it's in Python, in Prolog, or a pseudo language, or just like plain, plain SQL, but whatever KPI you come up with, it should be something that is reproducible, and it can be run only in one way. If you have this kind of role in a company, your most important thing you have to do is like you have to look at the data, really, with your eyes. And uh, if you tell me that average of this, average of that, you're fired on spot. If you say mean, I think we're getting there, but again, if you don't know what you're looking, what you're looking at, look at always the distribution and how the distribution changed throughout time. I'm gonna give you an example for that. But besides that, at this phase, typically you can survive with a very decent and small tool set, what is on every computer, even on Windows, like you can have Python, and as I'm quoting like Martin Lurch, who I'm gonna quote later again, if you're in doubt, use Postgres, really? A uh, company called Adjust sits in Berlin, who are doing uh, a great mobile tracker service. I think they just raised like 60 million euros like last week maybe. They handle all the data in a 20 terabyte Postgres cluster. So you can't tell me that it's not scalable. And you can survive in MetaBase if like a sole proprietor of data munching. Uh, you get what you pay for, it's free. I still have like open tickets issues with them for one and a half years, so it's not perfect, and nobody really wants to touch their closure code base, but still it's a viable thing if you want to get things lifted, and if you want to get data distributed in the company. So an example of like, what's the problem with average mean and, and distribution? Who uses MPS or Net Promoter Score at the company you work for? Anybody? You are a very lucky bunch, I'm telling you. Because MPS is a KPI is super popular in the business community. Like, you know, you measure how much, how often would your customer tell her friends that they sh you should use your product or service. Uh, but there's like a major problem with that because business always looks at it as like a number. Like, what's our MPS? It's like five, it's eight, it went up and down, and they start to worry about this. The problem is that even if this number is simple, it's constructed in a way that you can't really use it much. The way you collect your data, your sampling is skewed, like whoever answered this question is a different set of people, not the whole universe. Actually, answering this question is a pretty unsure uh, exercise, like you know how you rate this on like a one to 10 scale. But the worst problem is that the way you calculate MPS is very easy to hack because it's, it works like as a step function. There's a lady called Eva Reitzer. You should look at her blog post. She even gives you like a piece of R code, how to hack your MPS score. So if you ever has to provide MPS for the management, you know where to look, how to fix it. But again, it's not a problem of the concept. It's a problem how we look at it, that we just aggregate it like one single number and try to figure the random walk how does it have affect our business? If you collect the same data and you look at the distribution of answers and the change in the distribution of answers, you might get a much real understanding of what's happening in your custom, customer's mind. At this phase, again, one thing that's predictably wrong, it's called Google Analytics. Uh, everything is in an old familiar Snap interface, but the data you're collecting is missing at least 9% of the events you send to it. We can talk about later also. But on the other hand, you don't even get access to your raw data, just aggregates. If you pay the 150K per year, then you can get an access to atomic data, which is actually wrong by default. Don't use this, and again, I'm happy to put an XKCD uh, slide anytime because they collect a lot of interesting information. This slide is like last minute uh, entranced to this presentation. In the last two weeks, things started to get more and more crazy in the arena of the BI tools. 
and uh, again, it will not help our life much. Uh, I never understood why Tableau was not acquired by Microsoft like years ago, because you know Microsoft's BI offering is, I would call, super, and Tableau works in the same enterprise environment, uh, runs on Windows servers, and if you forget about that, it's like a hodgepodge of Rails, Postgres, and then in-house memory engine. It's still like a viable solution. And on the other hand, uh, we just got the news recently, the new head of uh, GCP or the Google Cloud Platform is coming from Oracle. So looking at how Google just snatched up Luca, the Royce Royce of the PR tools, it's very likely that Google is going to march toward this enterprise-oriented BI setup again. At the end of each section, I will refer to someone who is much more relevant than me in this one. I really advise you to look up this guy. It's called Martin Lurch. He sits in Berlin with Project A Ventures. That's like an incubator that not just gives money to companies, but also help them to build themselves. So he has to build every year like 10 to 20 uh, BI setups for a variety of companies. So he's seen some stuff. And he's having a pretty nice presentation about how to set up KPIs, typically in, in an e-commerce setup, I would say. Also, one very interesting presentation he's having about how to find any kind of value in data science if you're building a startup and you're like an early phase. And just to help us, they release their own internal ETL tooling. It's called Mara. These days they're working on dockerizing it, but it's still out there. It works pretty much well. It uses Postgres, very lightweight, good stuff. So let's get back to our pyramid. So we have, we have the middle, okay? We started to build a pyramid in the middle. Where should we go, up or down? Definitely we should go upwards because we are just eager to do some machine learning or data science because that's why we subscribe to this job anyway. So let's do some learning and optimization. And I think this is the original sin that uh, we, I don't know who came up with this idea that we call the whole thing data science. Like science is a way of understanding the world, doing experiments and trying to find universal laws and how the universe operates. This is not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is we're trying to analyze those clicks from half drunken users who clicked on something and we could manage to collect half of them, kind of. So this is not universal law. Uh, it's very important to be aware when we are looking at the signal and when we are looking at the noise and if it's, I mean, if it's possible that we can look at the signal or is there any signal, by the way. This is a bit of a bold thing because I, I, I circular learned a lot about A-B testing and the guilty as charged. I was involved in building our own A-B testing uh, tool set back in the Wunderlist Microsoft days. Been there, burnt lots of man months on making this happen and properly ship this into production and put it out on mobile devices and whatnot. But again, <coughs> just from an investment perspective, my bold advice is just don't do A-B tests at all and I have three main reasons for that for you. One is most likely you don't have enough data to be able to have a significant result within a given time frame, while everybody else in the company is deploying and changing and putting new marketing campaigns and whatnot, so it's not like a constant environment. Second, it's pretty hard to implement a proper A-B test. Most likely you will make major mistakes in this one. Again, get this charge. Three, if you manage to roll this out and you're happily ship your stuff and you do your A-B test, again, Analytical advice says that nine out of 10 cases is not worse what you shipped. So again, just from the investment perspective, you might find something, but if you multiply all these probabilities together, I'd say it's very unlikely that your investment, all the month you burn to roll out this thing, will give you any business benefit. Number from Simon Jackson, booking.com. Again, so if you wanna, even just the first step to have enough data, really, really. We have all these lovely A-B test sample size generators throughout the internet. You have to be big to be able to roll out. Another thing comes up this stage, R seeps into the organization. 
uh, up until now, I would say just like programmers generally are not happy about R because they they have the understanding of not everybody should design a language. So it's not like you know a given right by the constitution. Sometimes it happens, so it's super hard to put this thing in production, like the scale. But on the other hand, uh, I have to admit that if you have to ship small data products, typically like in-house, you know, for your marketing team, for your CM, whoever, a thing called Shiny, which is like a big hack, is a very, very nice and interesting tool. Because it's Shiny, you stay in R, and you can ship a thing that has a web interface, runs R code, you can even have like you know, login and whatnot, authorization. And uh, any other way, even if you do like simple, you might want to have like a small backend in Python and Flask, you might want to, s to run some SQL here and there, and then you still have to build some JavaScript. And it's like three different frame of mind. While it's shiny, you can stay in one. So you can ship things super fast, really. It will not scale much, but for an easy product, we are super, super happy to go this way. What are the leftovers of this part of the building? Again, typically we end up with a lot of non-reproducible tests and experiments. Something happened, we have a partial documentation, somebody found something or nothing. We have some R hodgepodge in production, hopefully not in the critical pathways. And again, a lot of this kind of inhibited information when you, when you come up with these new models, most likely you don't have time or the willingness to talk about all the presumptions you had while trying to build this thing. Okay, so now we have kind of pretty nicely the top part. Let's build it more. Now we're very, very trained and war thorn by data science. Let's do some machine learning and AI and deep learning and whatnot. This is the icing on top of the cake. And again, reality and the way we present things, the way we go to talk to our investors and ask for money, hey, we are the AI of something, might be a little different. There could be some gaps in reality. And uh, on this line of thought, I really recommend looking to Wikiboy because data science is different now, kind of reflecting on the current state that if you want to be a data scientist, what should you do, what you shouldn't do? If you became one, how sure your future is and what you actually do day by day. So we are over with this, oh, we have to do data cleansing all day type of thingy. We matured a bit, but it's interesting to reflect on still that the main problems are the ones that we used to have. And maybe even just like, you know, as they say that as people grow older, they just become more and more like they were younger. So Carpathy, I think, sti still sits with Uber, I don't know. But again, so it's, it's small, so the PhDs were about models and algorithms, while Tesla was about data sets, okay? So if you, like, try, if you try not to kill people with big cars, it's really about how to train reality into a model. They don't have much success with it yet, but they're getting somewhere. One constructive approach is that a lot of cases, again, you don't have enough data, what you can do as a data scientist or machine learning engineer is that you actually can make your data. Either it's simulations, or I've seen people actually building apps or parts of apps just to collect specifically more data from a, different, from a definite subset of users or universes. So it's meaningful what you're doing. Even after you're having a model and you see like, it's okay, but we need more data, maybe it makes sense to invest in this part. Other bad things happened to, to deep learning and machine learning in the last two years that almost everything got dockerized and Kubernetesized, and everybody's living in this inception world. Uh, notwithstanding, it might not be the best thing to do with data products. Still, I mean, we survived it, but we spent, I mean, previously we spent a lot of time, again, cleaning data. Now we spend more and more time actually putting things in production and covering them with all the, all the sugar coating that's needed from the contemporary uh, DevOps situations. And actually, I would say that right now, the most searched uh, job role, like people, HR people looking for data DevOps, this is the most important thing. Like It's like, again, the unicorn. Previously, they wanted to have like research engineers who are like a data engineer and the data scientist together. 
Now they also want to have like a, a DevOps under one roof. Not that they can find DevOps who are not data people anyway, but it's always good to, good to uh, look at. Another outcome that it gave the possibility for a lot of data platforms, so data science platforms to come up. I know uh, some of them make much sense, all the, all the uh, cloud providers are, are doing it, but again, coming from production, like in the last half year, we tried to put some, you know, nothing fancy in production, just like, you know, recommendation systems. The hard part is not to serve the recommendation, the hard part is to pre-compute the features. Can you pre-compute the features online, or you cache them, or do some kind of a mix? It's pretty hard. And again, if you look at what we actually gained from deep learning, I think it might be like a detour, in a way that the whole notion just gave us more and more computing power, really. But this screenshot, Real Compression in Machine Learning Scalar App, is coming from Pete Warden, who's uh, leading uh, the TensorFlow team, the mobile TensorFlow team at Google. And if you couldn't come up with any better thing like that, so really, like, we can kind of compress porn on the device, good. But uh, I wouldn't call it like a breakthrough, really. It might be interesting if you want to like transmit satellite data from a microcube down to Earth, but otherwise I don't see yet much the real usage. Um, but again, that could be something that we actually don't have to do this deep learning caravan in a centralized big server environment, but we can put these things on the end devices. It could be interesting because you don't have to ship and shower a lot of data, so much less privacy issues. Think about like a diabetes device, maybe. Uh, maybe you can just, you know, talking about the diabetes device, you deploy like a plain vanilla model on the device, which gets retrained locally. Data stays there, no privacy issues. You don't have to pay for the transition and, uh, and not for the energy consumption. It might give us something. A bit more worrisome, the whole status of autonomous driving, I'd say. Uh, this, is the, this could be the main culprit in the coming uh, AI winter, because it's like, like a lot of overpromises, and not much happened. Even those robotics companies who are actually being like proper robots are just chiming out of the business. And uh, the first one, this is like recent papers from the previous month, the first one is the really worrisome. Like, people actually started to check whether the freaking ImageNet works and they found that it's not, like, it works on the training set, but thank you, that's it. So we have to put a bit more thought on this one. But again, on the other hand, what we gain is we got access to much more computation power. Funny GPUs, as Bitcoin goes down, also we can get more GPUs for free, it's fine. And the three other ones are the more interesting ones from a mathematical perspective. That if we can really prove that all this deep learning hodgepodge is the same thing what we did before, we might try to use deep learning to construct models in a non-very efficient way. Uh, again, recent paper from last week, completely, like, I think, mediocre complicated model consumes that much energy that like two or three cars consume in a year in terms of like CO2 uh, output. But anyway, maybe so we will build the models with deep learning, but then if you have the model, you can actually turn them to something that's much easier to compute and run, like models, linear models, or bag of words, or you already know from the past. My hero of the day, he was speaking last day or yesterday, the day before in Berlin, in the Berlin buzzwords. Uh, Sigar is coming from Los Angeles, and uh, he's maintaining a pretty nice repository of benchmarks on different machine learning libraries. And also, he's like a practitioner, so you can look up his stuff. You can clone the GitHub repo and reproduce what he's having. And I'm getting into the funny part that he started to raise the flag that, I mean, nobody should use Spark for this kind of things because it's just not working. So. I had the same understanding and same uh, performance delivery when I killed the last Hadoop job I had. When I killed the last Hadoop job I had with a 
Python script, it became 10 times faster and it consumed one tenth of the resources. So like it got like two magnitudes better. I would say that it's very wise if you're in data science to learn a bit of an engineering because that might come useful later. But again, I'm just like a Eastern European guy who thinks always the bad things. Now we have the pyramid like fully built on top. High time to build the basement. At this time, typically things start to crumble and companies realize that data engineering is a thing. Like there are people who do data engineering. I, it's not, it's not, it's not a joke. Like I remember like a bit more than a year ago, I had to explain to like a pretty senior uh, data science manager in Berlin that this is a job, like it has a description. People does it. Um, and again, I'm coming back to my Eastern European roots. So when typically when the data engineering comes in, they either start slamming the bullshit bingo or start adding to it. Um, but again, adding to it is our original sin, if you look at engineering in general, I'd say. Because you see this kind of stack born of fashion and incompetence, and then typically what you do is like put another layer of guano on top of it and try to kind of hide it. This is the way banks build everything. But again, if you have a lot of time, I really, really recommend watching Jonathan Blow's recent presentation about preventing the collapse of civilization, which is like a very I would say a grandiose title, but it's talking about programming and like technical debt we have in our civilization and we are we all contribute to. It's a very funny uh, talk. This is a ferry in Germany. I'm not a beach constructor, but. I might have the impression that actually with half of the materials you could actually have like a bridge. Uh, this is the thing that I think we should definitely work on. We are all guilty as charged on this one either. And uh, again, whenever we think about distributed computing and all these kind of fancy things we have in the clouds, I always go back to this lovely chart that how much time does it take for a computer to do something? Read from memory, write to disk, talk to someone in a different uh, region, a different computer in the internet. And, uh, you know, the problem is that here we're talking nanoseconds, and here we're talking like milliseconds. It's like one to 150 million. These are like different magnitudes. And uh, that is the reason why, for instance, Spark is super slow. And uh, again, anecdotal, anecdotal advice came just this afternoon uh, that when people started to turn from Spark to Dask, they seen like a one-two magnitude of speed change for the better of Dask. So my generic advice is like, you know, you will get another machine if you can use one. No clusters for you, okay? No deployments. If you're machine is running out of RAM and CPU, we can talk. But until, just like, use what you have. Unix is not a bad thing. I will also get asked by this manager I mentioned that what makes a data engineer? Like, how do you define a data engineer? And I think data engineer for me is someone who's A, an integration engineer, and kind of a data architect, okay? But the main uh, qualitative thing is that you can embrace dirty reality. Like if you're a back-end engineer, you typically touch like one record, okay? But if you're a data engineer, you look at the universe and you have to understand all the falsehoods programmers think about names, places, time, and all these kind of things. Because reality is dirty. Like you can have a time zone of 6.75. It's out there. Another advice maybe that you should be able to get cloud agnostic because the war is going on here very, very much. If you want to have like a, the too long version, my understanding is that AWS is good, Azure has sales, and Google is cheap, okay? So neither has like one overarching something that you can make a decision by. Uh, and it might happen that you get involved in a migration war. 
half of the people I talk to these days are actually migrating from cloud A to cloud B. Typically to GCP, because GCP started the price war. Sometimes it works. I mean, when the whole thing doesn't go down. But it's interesting. Also, look at the benchmarks. Look at the benchmarks. Look at the product comparisons. And if you have to try to port services from A to B, it might prove impossible. I've been through one major migration from AWS to Azure. That's the cage. Now I'm doing like an AWS to GCP. That showed me how good AWS is actually. Again, basics. Like, I believe that we as data people just deserve better quality code. Okay? So even this old school thing that how we move data from A to B doesn't seem to be like a solved problem. And again, my understanding is not every star on GitHub was born the same. Just because people, something is popular, it doesn't mean it's actually it's like a reasonable code. Um, whenever you try to choose an ETL solution, make your choices and figure what you really need. Because again, we're preparing a bigger presentation about how Airflow is inherently wrong, for instance. Like, you don't have to have a cluster of three machines to load a database table with a 50-line boilerplate from A to B. Okay, it's like, it's like a classic example of, of like over-engineering. Check what Project Adventures did, like Mara. Metal is a solution when you have a lot of sources and they're changing. Uh, we're working on a new version of Night Shift right now in production that's also dockerized, which is like, you know, make, make SQL scripting. And it has phony and it has macros. It's like the smallest possible way of writing something without documentation because you actually write the code that runs the thing. I didn't know that. I suspected it, but I didn't know it. And after I realized that this is a story, much more things got clear to me. And it's like a big family of software tools that we use from Apache Foundation. But again, uh, just because something is open source, it shouldn't mean that it's unusable, okay? If you look at Hadoop, you have to kind of use other Cloudera Hortonworks mapper who are just about to go out of business, by the way, uh, to make it work. You have to pay them extra monies for consultants to somehow make it work. Same with Spark. You have to pay Databricks to have like a kind of stable distro. There's Airflow, but if you want to run like Airflow in Docker properly, which it should be in, in, in Kubernetes, because it spawns all these kind of workers and whatnot, then you have to pay for Astronomer because they kind of have like a working setup. So like, this is, I'm just telling you that this is not a necessary state of the union, okay? This is what we let them to be. To have some bit more concise understanding why I'm saying this, let's have the showdown. This is based on the, the works of Mark Lynchwick. I'm trying to convince him to come to Berlin to speak sometime. Who did a favor to run a, a lot of benchmarks on the classic New York taxi rides data set, which is like not a big thing, kind of a semi big data set. You can read all the things. I try to condense the main uh, outcomes and have some comparisons. Let's look at first Spark. Okay? He did the same benchmark runs in all the setups. We have some versions in AWS. We have one version in Raspberry Pi. So yes, you can run Spark in Raspberry Pi. You don't want to, but you can. Um, and the main findings are like not surprising that HDFS is much faster than S3. Good, we can use that. It actually managed to price out in Raspberry Pi because comparing uh, the vCPUs, we figured that it's like a 100 euro investment equals like one sixth of vCPU. And the good news for Spark that if you start to give it more metal, it's scaling linearly. I mean, it's super slow, but it scales linearly. Uh, talking to consultants who are working on Spark projects, their own estimate is that uh, out of 20 companies that are use, that's using Spark, most likely one needs it. 
Still, if they turn to Dusk, most likely they will get a one to two magnitude speed upgrade on their setup. Presto. This is the workhorse. Really, you know, we are super happy that Facebook just like put it out. The problem with Presto, besides it's the super cheap, cheap to run, and it's like really a good one if you want to run like data warehousing operations like things, is that it's non-linearly scaling. So the best outcome Mark had was like if he gave like one single big machine under Presto, then it felt good. And we might get back to the point that actually you have to keep in mind those times that it needs to do something for a computer. So it might be that actually the distributed part is not optimal in this one. I'm going to share these slides so you can look at the numbers, definitely, and also you can look at numbers at, at Mark's website. A lazy evaluation, if you come from like a you know, business manager perspective, like what solution should I choose? Should I go Presto or Spark or should I go Redshift? It's much more hard to compa compare because some things are like software as a service thing, you pay for usage or you pay for time. But again, what you can also calculate in for the total cost of ownership is what is the human cost of operating these things? And I'd say that if you look at the BigQuery, Amazon, Redshift thingies, they are performing pretty well compared to decent size deployments of the, of the cool new guys. Uh, but again, you have to keep them alive somehow. So maybe it makes sense to buy something from the shelf. What can you do with one machine? And here comes the funny part. Let's give like one big machine to all of these thingies so we cannot really talk about, you know, net ping times and whatnot, how fast they are. And here, Black Swan is called ClickHouse. ClickHouse is developed by Yandex. And uh, it just blew everything away. So that ClickHouse ran on a single machine, like a laptop with four cores. <laughs> and these things were running on like an i3 8x large. It's just like unbelievable. If you have time, check out ClickHouse. Uh, and again, you can fly with a single machine and deployment pretty far. Uh, this just kills the whole competition. Another topic. Do you use ad blocking personally? Okay, some people just. And coming back again to the Google Analytics thingy, maybe you use Google Analytics, maybe not. But actually, the current state of the union is that at least 9% of the events you send to a third party front end collector, be it Google Analytics, Segment IO, whatever you call it, is getting lost. We don't know which part of them. We don't know if like a user gets lost completely or just partially. But you think like that, uh, you know, we collect 100 events for like a three-step funnel. If you lose randomly nine out of that, your conversion rate could vary pretty much. This is like the minimum baseline you lose. Typically you use like 16%. In extreme, extreme cases, you can use like half of your events. So I think it's kind of okay to let people block the ads. I mean, right now, both Chrome and Firefox is trying to get around this. Let's see how it goes. But these days, it's, it's a big problem if you want to do any kind of marketing uh, conversion thingies in production. So you have to have your own front-end tracking. I have to have like, and I have to have a slide when there are arrows. So this is a small, very thin setup, how I would believe you could survive most of these things. We're about to open source two components. One component is like a front-end event collector that sits in AWS, super simple, API gateway, Kinesis, Firehose, S3, I think it's 500 lines altogether. But it can solve your problem if you're not big enough for the blockers to get noticed. You can have other uh, uh, workarounds. Some people actually are behaving bad and using Nginx proxies to send data to themselves, then to send it to Google Analytics. Uh, this is definitely something that you have to worry about. And again, 
I'm super happy that these days, uh, glue, glue is like, um, I might say that we have to remove glue because we did some uh, experiments with it and it seems like it's just as badly behaving Spark as everything else. So you get either like uh, Java stack trace vomit or simple like, you know, internal error, a lot of cases, which is pretty hard to debug. But what I'm really happy about is that we have Redshift with Spectrum. So now you can do the ELT, so you get your data, you don't, if you want to load it, you load it to Redshift, but you can kind of run your queries on the files with Presto, what they call Athena. So like, it's much easier. You can do even the Facebook way that you rebuild your data warehouse every day again and again, the whole thing, because S3 or even HDFS is not that expensive, so you can survive with that. And again, if you do something like this, your monthly cost should stop in the low thousands. Okay. That's for the crawling around. We might have this whole thing set up. Typically at this time, someone thinks in an organization that we need like a shepherd for this herd. Like let's have some kind of a bird of prey, a head of data, or let's call it something that takes care of all these crazy people. Then comes more like those parts when you have to make a decision that who you are, who can be are you. Because this is what you do most of the time. We all know that proving something is super hard, uh, but proving that it's not working is much easier, and that's what data does most of the cases. That you say no to people, and it needs some kind of a morale and a spine to be in this role for a long time because people will not like you. They come to you with all these kind of funny ideas and product features and marketing campaigns, and then in the end you say to them, no, didn't make any sense. Everybody's still looking for this animal. I'm pretty bad at German. I think it's the Eierling in the Forni show, something like that. It's called, like, you know, the universal animal. So I touched base on this one. Previously, everybody was looking for the research engineers who are like a data engineer and the data scientist. Now you also have to be a data adopts because for some reason Kubernetes gave up again. Um, super hard to find people who can deliver. Uh, I see like a pretty decent focus change from data science to data engineering these days. So the number of people looking for data engineers just like shot up pretty heavily. And uh, again, this is something that we try to address in some time that there are a lot of like data science boot camps out there, but how can you attack this problem of how do you grow data engineers suddenly? And it's not about like retraining Java engineers to Scala. So they are now a Spark engineer because this is also what people do. I would say that a lot of uh, problems one has if she's leading like a data department are revolving around the marketing department. Not just standing in the marketing department always have like a big budget and um, they have corporate power even if like a small company. So again, an anecdotal advice, like if the market department comes to you that they just spend like 200 Ks okay, on, a, on spam bots, and can you attribute them to like real users? That can be pretty hard, but you have to do this for some times. And I also seen that, that uh, when a company decided that they will use Salesforce from now on, and that should be like a data integration project the whole data engineer team left like that day. Like, thank you. Ad locking, it's very hard to get around with them, figuring out how, how you can actually have some, some sensible data from the customers, if you have this. Uh, as everybody's using the same channels for marketing, like Facebook, Google, and some small things, the whole CPA fuel bullets are gone, so like you can't make wonders, technically. Uh, and just as like disability computing is not a solved problem, attribution is not a solved problem either. And if you want to try to attribute based on the data that you have in Google Analytics, like you can just like, have like a, I don't know, draw some pictures randomly. You can get better. You can't trust your third-party data. I mean, if you keep your eye on the news and look at what type of mismeasurements 
Facebook and Google did in the last two years. The most extreme was when Facebook over-reported video usage by 900 percent, not two percent, 900. You have to make sure that you actually trust this data, and if you can, double-check it, do it. But still, for some reason, CRM is still not something that is solved. Like everybody is really, um, I understand that you promised all this stuff to the venture capitalists that you're going to grow and grow and grow, but keeping your customers is something that's actually pretty useful. And on this one, I expect more and more uh, cooperation in marketing and data, like how to make this really happen, not just like as a lip service way, how to deliver it. Get a charge. I did once what no one should do, like building our own CRM system. It's not impossible. Like in three months, we could turn our all communication systems, be it transactional or promotional, into like one system that was humming millions of messages every day with no worries and tabulating and whatnot. Do it, and uh, you will gain a lot to your company if you can. And finally, a bit of a word of a GDPR. Uh, GDPR for me it seems like that, you know, how we were with Y2K. Everyone was like really excited. The whole thing would go down and would stop working. Uh, but again, if you didn't do some crazy shit, like you didn't explicitly cheat your customers, it's about the process. Like you have to change, you might have to change business rules. You might have to behave, but it's not something that is like impossible to do. Um, I'm kind of happy that the programmatic advertisement industry is going down because they were the bad culprits in this whole game, I'd say. But as a matter of fact and a side effect, it had the outcome what we expected, that the big ones got helped and the small ones got executed a bit. Thank you. That was for today. Um, Again, I'm, I'm super excited that you stayed and you didn't leave, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have, be them for the public or be them private.